remain standing. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel. We'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. And we'll just we just have one verse, and I'll read that. We'll read that verse, then I'll pray, and then we'll be seated. 2 Samuel 17 and verse 23. And I'll give you just a moment to find that. And uh, look around. I see people no longer looking, but we will read, okay? 2 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 23. Let's all read that together. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and gathered him home to his house, to his city, and put his household in order, and hanged himself, and died, and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to thank you so much, Father, for your grace and your mercy upon us. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to be here together to, Lord, just to feast on your word and focus upon what you would have for us from the scriptures today. Help me, Lord, as I seek to bring this man, Ahithophel, uh, to the forefront in our minds that we can understand his heart and be challenged from your word that will follow you in obedience, however your spirit would speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's be seated. Have you ever read a verse? And you said to yourself, now, there's a man with a bad temper. I mean, he doesn't get his way. Nobody listens to him. So he goes home and he kills himself. You read that and you say, what? That's kind of irrational. What would cause a man to do something so irrational as to go home and commit suicide simply because people wouldn't listen to him? It sounds almost like a made-up story. You think of... Stories like Romeo and Juliet, where, you know, Romeo and Juliet, at the end of the story, they kill themselves. And you can almost understand Romeo and Juliet because, you know, they were love, they were deep in love, and they couldn't be together for the life. And so, I'm not condoning suicide, but I understand that. I don't understand, or let me say it this way, on the surface, it is hard to understand why Ahithophel would suddenly kill himself just because nobody wanted to listen to him. So having said all of that, Ahithophel is not one of those famous Bible characters that everybody knows about. In fact, chances are good that most of us in here uh, know very little about Ahithophel. But in the course of this message, you're going to find out that even though he may not be so well known, certainly his grandchild is. Uh, we'll learn that Ahithophel walked with royalty, he was seemingly on top of things. He was in charge of life. And everything seemed to be good. But then something happens to his grandchild. And that single event begins to fester in his heart until finally Ahithophel becomes a vengeful, bitter old man. When I become an old man, I just want to be an old man. I don't want to be bitter or vengeful about it. But his life changed. Do you know what bitterness is? The dictionary says, and I, I looked it up in the dictionary, the dictionary says that bitter is a strong, unpleasant taste. You know, like coffee without sugar. A lot of people say that that's bitter, okay? But we use bitter in other ways too. Bitter could be a painful emotion caused by something that is difficult to accept or a certain anger or hostility. That's bitterness. Bitterness leaves us cold and often hostile toward others. It also leaves us apathetic toward God. Bitterness is, I think, an unbiblical, this is my definition, un, it's an unbiblical emotional response that is manifest by our attitudes and our actions toward a violation of our own personal justice system. So you've got some idea of what you believe to be right and wrong, and when somebody violates that, then it's easy to become bitter if you allow that to fester in your heart. Bitterness is a sin. It's not just an emotion. It is a sinful emotion. And it's a sin that often goes unnoticed. And then, all of a sudden, it becomes very clear that there is a heart problem. Bitterness has crept in. 
The Bible offers us several warnings against bitterness. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, and I want you to notice how bitterness is placed alongside of other things here. He says, Ephesians 4 and verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Notice that bitterness is listed along with wrath and anger and clamor as sins that according to the Bible we must put away. They're going to come. You're going to experience these things. And when they happen, you are challenged by the Word of God to put them away. Keep in mind that bitterness is just as much a part of your life as anger or wrath or clamor or evil speaking. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. The Bible says this. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. According to Hebrews 12.15, bitterness not only hurts the person who has become bitter, but it can also grow into a big, ugly mess that hurts others as well, that hurts people around you as well. And here in, in Hebrews 12, 15, it's called a root. You know what a root is? It's that part that grows underground, the part that is unseen, the part that is unknown. Where we live or, or where my wife has her little house up in such a, we have a problem with bamboo. Bamboo grows under the ground and then it pops up here and you chop it down. And then it grows under the ground and pops up here. You've got to get the root out. If you don't get the root out, you can't kill the stuff. In America, the southern part of America, we have a vine called kudzu. How many of you know about kudzu? Yeah. If you've been to America, especially in the south, you know about kudzu. In 1876, somebody got this bright idea that they could bring this vine called kudzu to the United States from China and they would plant it and that would help with soil erosion. What they didn't figure on was the fact that in America, kudzu has no natural enemies. Nothing eats it. People don't eat it. Birds don't eat it. Bugs don't eat it. Nobody eats kudzu. Now I understand there's starting to be some now. But for a long time, kudzu had no natural enemies. So what happened? It grew and took over the South. It swallows forests at the rate of 2,500 acres a year. If you don't think in acres, that's a lot of land, okay? It covers everything. You can drive through the states of North Carolina and South Carolina, and you can see forests, but you can't see the forest because all you see is this vine that is slowly taking over everything. In fact, it's even got a nickname now. They call it the Vine that ate the South. And it's a good illustration of bitterness. Because it begins small. And it just grows and grows. And consumes you until it's out of control. Until there's nothing left to see except that ugly bitterness in your life. Now, as I said, Ahithophel was a grandfather. And the love of a grandparent is a special kind of love that I cannot explain to you. You must be a grandparent in order to understand it. I used to listen to other grandparents say the same thing to me, and I would say, oh, I can understand love, not the grand grandparent stuff, okay? It is uh, far and beyond anything that I could explain to you. It is a special kind of love that you have to experience in order for it to be understood. It's it's indescribable, and I've, I've heard it said that grandchildren, grandchildren is God's reward for not killing your children before they got married. All right? So you can understand the kind of feelings that Ahithophel, as a grandparent, would have had for his famous grandchild. And so when we study the life of Ahithophel, and at the same time, considering the love of a grandparent, it becomes pretty clear 
What caused Ahithophel to get so angry that he went home and committed suicide? So right now you're going, okay, great. Who's Ahithophel? Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 27. And I want you to see, first of all, the, the testimony that distinguished his life. 1 Chronicles chapter 27, and look at verse 33. 1 Chronicles chapter 27 and verse 33. It says this, And Ahithophel was the king's counselor. And Hushai, remember that name? We're going to talk about him a little bit later. And Hushai, the archite, was the king's companion. So, if we look at every passage in the Bible where we find Ahithophel, you're going to find out that the Bible often speaks of Ahithophel as a counselor. He's a counselor, or he is counseling somebody to do something. And in this case, we find out that he is not just a guy that gives good advice. This is the king's counselor. And in this case, it's King's, King David. Now, to put that in modern terms, what's a king's counselor? Well, um, that would be like the special advisor to the president. Whenever the president has to make a decision, he has a special advisor. Always in the know. Always by his side. In touch with everything that's going on. And giving the king counsel. And so, he would have been the one to advise David whenever David had to make a big decision about something, or maybe even a small decision that was hard to figure out. Uh, he would help David in that way. And so I can just imagine that a man like Ahithophel and David would have had a fairly close relationship. They would have known each other quite well. And David, as a wise king, would have placed a lot of uh, confidence in the uh, counsel of Ahithophel. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. Proverbs 1, verse 5 says this. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. So I imagine David, being a wise man, generally speaking, would have listened to the counsel of Ahithophel in many, many ways. But something else I want you to know about Ahithophel is that Ahithophel is not an irrational evil man. At least not initially. Ahithophel was a good man. Turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16 and look at verse 23. 2 Samuel 16 verse 23. It says this about Ahithophel. It says, In the counsel of Ahithophel which he counseled in those days was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. More about that later. So when Ahithophel spoke, people heeded his counsel. They followed his counsel. They listened when Ahithophel spoke. And everybody knew that Ahithophel's advice, you might as well have been getting advice from God himself if Ahithophel's advice was that good. So if Ahithophel told you something, it was like, well, you know, that's as good as gold. He was that kind of counselor. And he was a good man, a godly man. By all that we can learn from him in his early years, we would have to say that he was a good man. And that's one of the main reasons, by the way, why Ahithophel would have become David's counselor, because he was so wise in his counsel and such a good person. But as wise as he was, as godly as he may have been, tragedy came into his life. And it was a tragedy that damaged his life. And I think it might be a good place for us to, uh, to point out something that you, you probably already knew this. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, I don't know. But in spite of David's perception of Ahithophel, no matter what David thought about him, in spite of Ahithophel's reputation as a wise man and a good counselor, something was not right on the inside. Something was desperately wrong on the inside, and nobody saw it. Nobody knew it was there. He was being slowly consumed from the inside out by an event that happened years earlier, an event which, over which he had no control, but it so impacted him 
that it began to change him, really, to the end of his day. So, in a sense, I pointed out all of those good things about Ahithophel, just so that I could bring this obvious truth to light. You simply cannot know what's happening in a person's heart. You can, I can look at you, and I can talk to you, and there can be a smile on your face and a song on your lips, but what's really in your heart, I can't know. Nor could you know about me. We really, go, we really don't know each other as we like to <coughs> say that we do, because we can't see the heart. So what exactly was the tragedy then? What happened to Ahithophel? What changed him? What was that significant emotional event that hurt him so deeply that he ended his own life so irrationally? Remember the first text we read. Ahithophel gave counsel. Nobody listened. He went home. He got his house in order. And he killed himself. Pretty rational until we know what's behind it all. It all goes back to his grandchild his famous grandchild. Whereas Ahithophel is not so famous, everybody in this room knows the name of his grandchild. You know it? Yeah. Follow me now as we go through some Bible passages and we look at some important truths from God's Word that will help us understand who this man is. First turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 34. We're going to read a couple passages with names. And often when you read through the Bible and you read names, you're just like, a blah, a blah, a blah, a blah, blah. You know, if you read the genealogies fast enough, you start feeling sorry for Andy, because you'll read, and it'll say, somebody had a son, and he died. Somebody had a son, and he died. So you start feeling sorry for Andy. But pay attention to the names in the genealogies. They are really quite helpful. Notice this, 2 Samuel 23, verse 34, uh, where it says, El, uh, Elip, Elipheleth. The son of Ahashbai, the son of the Maakathite, Eliam, that's the name I want you to notice, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. So there he is, Ahithophel had a son named Eliam. He said, yay! How does that help me? Okay, let's move on. So we learned that Ahithophel has a son named Eliam, and Eliam is also fairly well known, uh, unknown, except that he was a special soldier in David's army, and he had a very important child. Notice this, 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 3. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of who? Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So now you know the rest of the story. In the words of Paul Harvey, right? Somebody told me this morning you've got to be old to know who Paul Harvey was. That's okay. Uh, maybe somebody understood that. Maybe not. So now you know the rest of the story. Ahithophel's grandchild was none other than Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, the wife of Uriah. And I'm sure you know the story of Bathsheba. One evening, David was up on his rooftop, and he looked out, and he saw a beautiful young lady washing herself, and his lust took over. So David asks around. He says, who is that girl? Who is that woman? And he finds out that she is the daughter of one of his mighty men the wife of one of his generals, the granddaughter of his trusted counselor. You would have thought that that would slow David down, but it didn't. He takes Bathsheba anyway. Then, when his sin is discovered, that or let me say it this way, when, when she gets pregnant and he's afraid that it will be discovered, he then devises a plan to get rid of Uriah, her husband, has him killed in battle, and then David takes Bathsheba, who is pregnant, home to himself to be his wife. So Bathsheba was the one that David took in adultery. She was the one who became pregnant by a man who was not her own husband. She was the wife of the man that David killed in an attempt to
to cover his sin. And if Ahithophel was the type of God-fearing grandfather that I believe he was, and had a deep love for his grandchildren, which I believe he did, no doubt this was quite upsetting to him. David had brought turmoil into their homes. Bathsheba must have been doing so well, married to a general, a beautiful young lady, until the night that David came and took her. It probably broke Ahithophel's heart to find out that his son-in-law was killed in battle and probably broke his heart even more to watch his granddaughter as she wept over the death of her husband. It probably hurt him deeply to watch Bathsheba go through all of that pain and then to have the child, which would have been Ahithophel's great-grandchild, and to know that that child died because of David's sin. That would be enough to make anyone become bitter. All that sadness, all that brokenness in their home, all that pain that, that shook him, all the horror of the situation and the sinfulness of it and the anger that came in, and it was all revealed that it was David's fault. David caused it. Now, I know that David repented. I know the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. I understand that. But I also know that if I were a Hithophel, I would have been pretty angry myself. And probably you would too. But there's another part of the story that often goes unnoticed when people speak of Ahithophel, but I think it's a very crucial part of the story in our understanding of what transpires. And you might remember the story where David, he, David had a son named Amnon and a daughter named Tamar. And the Bible says that Amnon had a friend who was a wicked friend. And uh, he gave, uh, his friend gave Amnon some wicked advice. And so Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar. And David's other son, Absalom, was so upset about it, so angry about the situation, that he wanted to kill Amnon. But David, who finds out about it, who knows about it, doesn't do anything. And Absalom is irate. And again, the Bible doesn't say this clearly, but in my opinion, I think that might have been the seed of why later in life, Absalom, David's own son, rebels against him and tries to take the throne from David. I'm sure he expected David to do something. But when David took no action, Absalom ends up finding a way to kill Amnon himself. And then what happens? Absalom has to go on the run. And he's on the run. He doesn't even see his father for three years. And finally he's able to return to Jerusalem. But even then he doesn't see his father for two more years. So for five years, Absalom never sees his father. And all the while, Absalom's angry, bitter heart was plotting to overthrow the throne of his father David. And so it's in that time frame, with all of that going on, while bitter-hearted Absalom was plotting to overthrow his father David, that Absalom realizes Ahithophel might be a good asset. He might be somebody that I can use. So he sends for Ahithophel. And that's what we read in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 12. It says that Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor. And I believe that this bitter-hearted Absalom knew exactly who he could get to help him. He picked Ahithophel purposefully. Absalom was angry. I think he was still angry over the rejection of his father, and, you know, Amnon and that whole situation. And considering what David had done to Ahithophel's granddaughter, you know good and well that Absalom and Ahithophel are suddenly, you know, their allies in this situation. And Ahithophel had been allowing his anger and his hurt and his frustration and his bitterness burn within him. Now it's been about ten years. And Ahithophel has this whole time feigned loyalty to David as David's counselor, while inside he hated him. So the message comes from Absalom that says, Hey, Ahithophel, why don't you come join my team? And immediately he goes. 
biding his time, waiting for the opportunity to arise until he was brought to the point of acting out on his revenge. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 17 now. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men. This is what Ahithophel says to Absalom. He says, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night. And I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed. And I will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee. And I will smite the king only. I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if all returned, so all the people shall be in peace. And the saying pleased Absalom well and all the elders of Israel. Did you see what he said here? He said, Absalom, let me go. I'll go and I'll kill David. And I'll bring all the people back to you. And Absalom liked that idea. He said, man, that's a great idea. Now, we, we don't have time to read the rest of the chapter. But after Ahithophel begs Absalom to go kill David, some other events happen, and Absalom decides not to take Ahithophel's advice. Then, when Ahithophel saw that his plans had failed, and that the man that he hated so much, King David, the one he wanted to kill, was actually going to escape out of his grasp, and probably go back to taking the throne, and Absalom knew, or Ahithophel knew that that was the death toll for him. He knew that his foe was going to escape. And it was over for Ahithophel. He knew that. So he goes and he takes his own life rather than having to face King David. That's the story behind the story. That's why he killed himself. It wasn't... Well, suicide's always irrational, let me just say that. But in the mind of one who is killing himself, someone committing suicide, their actions are not irrational to them. They're irrational to the rest of the world, but to, to the one who commits suicide, it is the only escape. There is no hope. And so this is what Ahithophel feels, and that's why he does it. Now I want to just kind of talk a little bit about the, the kind of thinking that darkened his life. It would appear from an overview of events, that Ahithophel blamed David for what happened with Bathsheba. I know I would have, and truly he should have, because David was to blame. It was David that took the initial step. It was David that drew Bathsheba into the sin of adultery. It was David that hatched the plot to kill Uriah in order to hide his sin. And I'm sure that Ahithophel blamed David for bringing a reproach upon his granddaughter's name. And if I may say so, his name too. The thing is, Ahithophel was right. David did some bad things. Ahithophel was right in his opinion of David. How could David, the king, who could have any woman in, in the whole country? How could David choose his granddaughter? How could he do such a thing? A man after God's own heart. How could he disgrace the Lord like that? And furthermore, how could David disgrace his friends like that? And of all his friends, Ahithophel, one of his supporters, one of his close confidants. So after thinking about it and brooding for quite some time, Ahithophel sees an opportunity to strike back. And so he says in 2 Samuel 16, verses 20 through 22, Then said Absalom to Ahithophel, Give counsel among you what we shall do. And Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Go unto thy father's concubines, which he had left to keep his house. And all Israel shall hear that thou art a whore of thy father. And then shall the hands of all that are with thee be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Folks, this is some unbelievable stuff that's in God's Word for us to read and learn from. 
Absalom goes to take his father's concubines. He takes them up to the house and forces them on David's rooftop. Now, I don't know if you caught all this, but this is exactly what God said was going to happen to David because of his sin with Bathsheba. So back in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when Nathan, the prophet, confronts David about his sin, this is what he says to him. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, notice verse 11. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. Now I don't know if Ahithophel knew about the prophecy or not, but he, he definitely moved it to fulfillment. That much is very clear to me. And where did Absalom commit this horrid, revengeful act? On the same rooftop that David looked out from when he saw Bathsheba. Can you see the change happening to Ahithophel? Here was a man that gave God the advice and his words were as if they were the oracle of God. And now he tells Absalom to go commit a horrible sin. It's a horrible sin without David being the father. It's only compounded because David was his father. The man who had once given good advice now gives wicked advice. It's almost as if Ahithophel is thinking, I got you David, I got you now. Your own son is asking me for advice on how to hurt you. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to get what's coming to you. But simply hurting David was not going to be enough. What Absalom did was not enough. That Ahithophel was not satisfied. He wanted to go farther. He wanted to kill him. He wanted to destroy him. You see, that's another thing about bitterness. It never feels as if the demands have ever been met. It keeps crying out for more. More revenge. More blood. So when we get to the beginning of 2 Samuel chapter 17, Ahithophel is ready to commit murder just as David had once done. 2 Samuel 17 verses 1 and 2, Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men. And we read it earlier where he said, Let me go and I'll kill him. His wise counselor for 10 years now has been brought down to the point of a murderer, wanting to kill him, corrupted in his character because of bitterness. Bitterness had so consumed him that he has now become just like the man that he hated. David committed adultery, and so now Ahithophel tells his son to go and do the same. David had stolen another man's wife, and now Ahithophel tells his son to go do the same. David had committed murder, and now Ahithophel is ready to do the same thing himself. He has become like the thing that he hated because of bitterness. Bitterness will do that to you. Bitterness will turn you into the very thing that you are bitter about. It will destroy you. A heart of bitterness turns a good man, a good man, into a treacherous traitor. Kind of reminds me of Judas, Judas Iscariot. And he comes to a bitter end, just like Judas. If you remember, Judas went out and hanged himself. And again, we need, to, we need to keep this in mind. There's another piece to the story here. David had another companion named Hushai. I said, remember the name. Remember when I said that? Hushai. During Absalom's rebellion against his father David, David asked Hushai, Hushai, I want you to go get on the inside with Absalom. I want you to be a spy for me. I want you to get in there and stay in Absalom's presence and spy on him and tell me what's going on. So here in 2 Samuel 17, Ahithophel wants to go kill David, but Hushai advises against it. Notice what happens in verses 5 through 7. 2 Samuel 17, verses 5 through 7. Then said Absalom, Call now Hushai the archive also. Why? Because Hushai had been David's companion. Right? So now he wants to know what Hushai thinks too. And let us hear likewise what he saith. And when Hushai was come to Absalom, Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken after this manner. Shall we do after his saying? If not, speak thou. And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. 
So how did Ahithophel take that? When he found out that Absalom was not going to listen to him. That Absalom was going to listen to Hushai. What does he do? He gets so angry that he goes home and he kills himself. But why is he angry? Because, no, because nobody listens to him anymore? No. Because somebody else's counsel was listened over his? No. He's angry because he cannot kill David. And the thought of not being able to get revenge just burned him to the point where he couldn't handle it anymore. The key to all of this is in verse 14. 2 Samuel 17, 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord hath appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. At that point, Ahithophel said, it's over. There's no hope. It's done. David's going to escape. I will not get my revenge. In fact, my future looks pretty dark. And so he went home and he killed himself. Now let's look at the teaching that defined his life. In his book, a book that was written by a guy named Charles Rasselman, he wrote a book called Lee, The Last Years, and it's referring to Robert E. Lee. And Robert E. Lee was in Kentucky, he visited a lady who took him to the remains of a very large oak tree. And that oak tree had been absolutely destroyed during the, uh, during the Civil War by the Federal artillery um, that you know, had destroyed the, uh, the tree. The, the Union soldiers had just really destroyed that area. And so she looked to General Lee for some words of comfort, condemning the North for their violence against her tree, you know, to sympathize with her for her loss. And after a few seconds of silence, Robert E. Lee looked at her and said, cut it down, ma'am, and forget about it. That's exactly what Ahithophel should have done. And that's what some of us need to do. If there's a root of bitterness growing in your heart, cut it down. Destroy it. Forget about it. Move on. But he couldn't. Ahithophel couldn't forgive and forget. And finally he brought him to the end. His lesson, his life, is a lesson to us of what we must not do. We must not allow bitterness to creep in. So what must we do? Forgive. Forgive. What can I do to avoid becoming another Ahithophel? Well, first of all, recognize that your bitterness is a sin too. And you need to repent of that bitterness. You can start there. And then remember to forgive the person you're bitter to. Ephesians chapter 4, we read verse 30 earlier. I want you to see verses 31 and 32. Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I don't know what they did to you, but I know what we did to Jesus. And if He could forgive us, we ought to be able to forgive one another. But there's a what if that I want to ask. What if Ahithophel had forgiven David? Apparently his son Eliam had forgiven David. Because Eliam was one of David's mighty men. So there must have been some forgiveness there. What if Ahithophel had, had been like his father Eliam? What if he would have forgiven David? Then he wouldn't have helped Absalom. That's for sure. He wouldn't have been a rebellious murderer at heart, that's for sure. But we really don't know how to answer the question because that's not what happened. It's not what happened. Instead, Ahithophel ended his life. He committed suicide. The root of bitterness finally destroyed him. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Some of you, I know, you know, if, if your baby is ugly, your baby is ugly. 
which is kind of an American way of saying that if there's a problem there, admit it. Don't ignore it. But I know for a fact from discussing various things with numerous of us that are in this room, I know for a fact that there are people in this room that are dealing with unforgiveness. The piano's going to play. Before that root of bitterness springs up in you and troubles you and defiles so many around you, cut it down. Forget about it. As a piano plays, won't you come? But pastor, you don't understand. Maybe I don't. But I understand what the Bible says. You don't know what they did to me. Well, I'm sure they didn't crucify you. I'm sure they didn't beat you with a cat of nine tails. And yet Jesus, looking out from the cross, said, Father, forgive them. And they know not what they do. And if he can forgive sinful man, after all that we've done, we ought to be able to forgive one another. story because the real story kind of lays behind putting the pieces together. But God's word is such that once we put those pieces together, they challenge us. Has the Lord spoken to your heart? Can you bring yourself in your heart to forgive whoever it is for whatever they've done? To restore your life stuck right where you are for the rest of your life. Stuck right there. You're never going to grow anymore. Spiritually speaking, you're never going to move past where you are because you have chosen not to forgive. Have you ever needed forgiveness? somebody and you needed them to forgive you, well now it's your turn. You're on the other end. Will you extend it? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this challenge, dear God, that given us from the scriptures concerning the life of a Hithophel. We don't want to be like that. And we struggle sometimes, Lord, because we always think that we're right. We think that the other person should always make amends to us. But Lord, in our unforgiveness, that root of bitterness is springing up, troubling us, and defiling so many things around us. Lord, help us to deal with that. We want to walk before you uprightly. We want to walk before you in purity. We don't want to be stuck right where we are. I would ask, Lord, I would beg you to do a work in our hearts. We'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to be dismissed in just a few moments. I want to remind you, we do have a 2 o'clock service. I really want to see everybody here for that, all right? Yeah. I really, really want to see the same group of people here at our 2 o'clock service. And if you have a reason why you can't be in church at 2 o'clock, for whatever reason, um, I recommend this week that you take a look at your schedule and figure out how you can work it out. Because this is God's house. We're God's family. We're, we're family with one another. And so rework your schedule so you can be in God's house and be with God's people. All right? So with that, Brother Kim, would you close us in prayer and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much today.